Just really let the Holy Spirit minister to you, minister to you right now. Just in this quiet atmosphere. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, to your sanctuary, till we're sent. I can only bow down and say, you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise to you alive. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. Look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your face. I can only bow down and say, Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for choosing to be with us either in person or online this Mother's Day. 
We want to say a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Um, I know that Mother's Day is, and with all occasions, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, right? Some of us are really excited because our mothers are around and we can celebrate with them, and so we're happy. But then there's a whole lot of other people that have different situations, people who have lost their mothers, people who wish they were mothers, people who have lost children. There's all kinds of emotion wrapped up in Mother's Day and, and all of our events, right? And so we just want to let you know that wherever you find yourself on Mother's Day, that Jesus is right there with you. Whether you're rejoicing and we rejoice with you, or whether you're mourning, we mourn with you, but you have access to the love and the peace and the power of God at any point along that spectrum. So I want to read a verse as we enter into worship from 1 Thessalonians. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And this is our choice. We can choose to live this way wherever we find ourselves, in rejoicing or in mourning. We're encouraged to rejoice and to be thankful and to pray all the time. So we're going to come into worship this morning. And this is, what we're, this is what we're setting aside a place for, to rejoice and to pray and to give thanks. And that's the heart with which we want to come before the Father as we come together and worship him. All right? Amen. So let's stand together, and I'm going to open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are high and holy and infinitely able to give and to bless and to love. And that is something that we can get excited about. That's something that we can rejoice in and we are thankful for. So God, we choose right now to set aside this place in our minds and our hearts and our spirits where we can choose to rejoice in the goodness that you have shown to us. And that we can pray for those areas that aren't quite there yet. And that we can be thankful in all things. And that you have given us so much to be thankful for that we can always be thankful. God, thank you that you are so good to us. And thank you that you are here with us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Bethany. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. So yeah, I know it's probably not, it's not super fun to uh, sing into the mask, but you know, whatever you can do to sort of raise your voice or raise your, uh, just, just to worship this morning, raise your hands, close your eyes, stand, sit. Uh, sometimes I hum into my mask. But yeah, whatever you can do to join, to join with us together this morning.
to get through the day. We thank you, Lord. Peace over their minds, over their bodies. Sweet sleep for those who don't sleep in or, or don't get enough rest. And renew their energy. And give them, the, give them the will to face the day, Lord. We thank you for that now.
the fragrance of heaven pour your spirit out pour your spirit out oh holy anointing the power of your presence pour your spirit out pour your spirit out oh Oh dear, again for you, for in the hour. 
We'll trust in our God. That's, uh, that's kind of like, it's faith, right? Trusting in God and not being shaken. You remember we talked a couple weeks ago about the idea that faith is one of the theological virtues. So what are the theological virtues? They're virtues that have to do with God. So faith is a theological virtue because it's focused on God. It's something that God put inside of us. And it's something that God teaches us about and reveals to us and it helps us to grow in. So the trust that we have in God, that unfailing trust not to be moved and not to be shaken, it's not because of how strong we are or how, how good we are at holding on tight. It's because God himself is trustworthy and unshakable and he has deposited faith inside of us so he's put it in there. His faith is inside us. And then through the process of life, he reveals to us and teaches us how to grow in faith. So it's not about you. You might think, I'm pretty shakable. I, I, I try and trust in things, but I get pretty shaken. My faith in the Blue Jays gets shaken very easily from one game to the next. But my faith in God, I'm... It's, it's faith in him that he put in there that he's teaching me how to express. Didn't our brand do a great job today? Did you notice Sarah on the piano? So good. Great job, Sarah. 
Uh, thanks so much, worship team. You guys are um, in due for a raise. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements for those of you who are uh, part of our community and uh, you'd like to give today. There's a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, if you're here in the room, uh, we have uh, a uh, debit machine at the back and Collins is taking a turn managing that and he is just as good at handling that as Doug is. He's been learning from Doug over the last year, number of years and he can handle that debit machine no problem. Uh, if you're not here, or if you are here and you prefer to give by mail, uh, you can, if you'd like a pen pal, I mean, mailing has kind of gone out of vogue, but, you know, it's still fun to do, and if you want to send us a note, we'll send one back. Uh, the mailing address is there on the screen, and of course, if you are um, a savvy uh, consumer in the 21st century, is that, is that what we're in now? Whatever it is. Uh, you can give by uh, e-transfer to uh, our giving email address is giving, G-I-V-I-N-G, at vccnl.ca. Uh, this is not for me, but when it's there, you know, you feel like you just got to lean on it. A um, couple other quick announcements. We, I mentioned there previously we are going to start a, um, a, uh, a, a study uh, uh, with Josh Hoffert. If you remember, Josh visited with us uh, last fall. Josh is uh, out of PEI, and his ministry is called Wind Ministries, and he sort of grew up uh, in something called Streams uh, International, I think which was John Paul Jackson's ministry. And so uh, Josh is going to lead us in a, a five-week study, and we're going to start uh, Sunday evening, May the 30th, so uh, we'll have registration details for that coming up soon. But the, the, the study is hearing and responding to God. And so, you know, we kind of do that in everyday life, but there's also a very intentional way that we can look to hear from God, respond to him, and, uh, and look for ways that God might want to bring uh, supernatural uh, experiences into our everyday lives and our everyday encounters. So that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, another quick announcement. This coming weekend, we are hosting a prayer gathering, sort of a prayer and worship gathering here. Um, it will, it, we don't really have special speakers lined up or a lot of teaching planned. It's mostly going to be just hanging out, singing, praying, uh, waiting on God. So that's coming up this weekend, and uh, there's registration information in your emails. And if you haven't got it, check your junk mail. And if you haven't, still don't have it, uh, just get in touch with somebody, and we'll get the details to you. Uh, that's it. So without further ado, we have uh, a very special guest with us today on Mother's Day, which is very appropriate, uh, Ms. Jan Adams, who uh, she is, uh, she came to us from Illinois, I think, right? Uh, she, I think the, uh, there was a Pentecostal school here, and they were recruiting. We need good teachers here in this remote outpost of Newfoundland. And Jan responded to the call, and uh, she moved here many years ago. And not only did she come and pick up a job teaching, but she became a mother uh, in Newfoundland, really. So she's got, uh, she was a mother to two uh, beautiful daughters, and then she was a mother to a, a whole uh, a generation of students. And then she's also uh, become a mother in our city through a number of uh, amazing initiatives. So Jan... Uh, we are absolutely delighted, and it's a pleasure to have you, and so please come. Is that it? Okay. Try to watch my time. Although there's something that came to me that I want to share a little bit at the beginning. And um, this is for the young people, the children. Um, I want to encourage you on this Mother's Day and every day to follow that scripture, honor and obey your mother and father. It is the only commandment with promise and it is something that I prayed over my daughters 
their whole lives, not because I wanted an easier time with discipline, but because of that promise, because God said that your life would be well and long. And that parenting is on a number of levels, you know, in the church and all that, but especially in your home. One other thing, I just feel to say, it's not in my, these two things aren't in my notes. Oh, and I will tell you a little incident with my mother. Um, I was in my 20s and graduated, Kai and I were married. We were traveling with them over to visit relatives in Sweden. And I got, for some reason, irritated with this beautiful, gentle woman. And I said something. And the Lord has, as you will hear in my talk, just been so wonderful and gentle. But he was not a happy camper with me on this day. And he just spoke to me. He said, what do you think? Just because you've been to college, you know, like you think you know more than them? And he said, they enabled you to go to college. They enabled all this. Do you think by any stretch of the imagination you could ever have the wisdom that they had? I said, thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. And you better believe it was a new day for me way back in my 20s in how I saw and respected my parents, and I was very thankful for that word. One other thing I really prayed a lot and worked on with my two girls was gratitude. I can't tell you how gratitude is a guard over our hearts. If you are thankful, right, and you look at the things, especially not only God, but all the things in your life that he's provided, and, um, and you know, it says pray, and give thanks, not for everything, right? Because there are some things that are, you know, I don't give thanks for, but I give thanks to him because he's there. If you start being thankful and looking around your life with thankful eyes, I'm not kidding you, it will change your life. So those just two things just came to me. Um, I hope it's not going to be a 10 Kleenex time. I started out with a little emotion already. Uh, Steve, who's come from Michigan, actually went to church with some t really good friends of mine. In fact, I was in their wedding. And so that was a memory and kind of an emotion, thinking about them and then Reuben. <laughs> oh, Reuben and I go way back. I love Reuben. It's so good to see him here <laughs> anyway. I know, I know. Anyway, so picture, can we get that picture of my mom up? <laughs> if possible. Um, when mom stopped eating in her final nine days and her passing was imminent, things were coming to my mind, some that I had previously shared um, when I spoke on a Sunday morning with my uh, worship center family. Um, and they were coming to my mind, and I just felt that I needed to do more than a tribute. I needed to kind of share our journey. So I asked my dad, I said, Dad, would you mind if I gave the message at Mom's funeral? And he said, no, he said, you do it. You do what you're feeling. So, so this, um, a lot of what I'm sharing is, is what I shared back. Mom was born in two, uh, 1918 and lived to 2015. So this, this was delivered on February 16th, 2015. Do you have the, anyway, when you, if they can get that picture up, it's on a, a first picture of a, a video. Um, because mom and dad at the last years, I really prayed because I was up here and I couldn't be there at birthdays and I couldn't be there for Thanksgiving, which was always big and that. Um, I did pray. I said, Lord, if you could extend their life so in my retirement I could spend time with them. And he did. It was glorious. Mom died at 96 and dad at 97. <laughs> But we did quite a bit of traveling together, and, and, and sometimes we even flew. And um, they had Delta numbers, you know, Delta the airplane, and, and everything came to my email for mom and dad. And the Tuesday before she died, one of the subject lines in an email popped up from Delta, and it said, Geraldine. Make your great escape this year. And I thought, well, that was pretty prophetic. <laughs> 
It tickled us how my mom could be very definite about things. Still always sweet, but definite. After dementia set in, in and when she was about 90, she announced to us, I'm not wearing dresses to church anymore. Only old ladies wear dresses. <laughs> we have no idea who could have been the old lady she was referring to. We had um, Proverbs 3 read at her funeral as well as uh, Proverbs 31 to capture the woman she was. There's much in Proverbs 3 that describes her and how she lived. First, she kept commands in her heart, and they, to quote Proverbs 3, prolonged her life many years and brought mom peace and prosperity. This passage talks about faithfulness, and mom was a person of faith who readily shared it. Um, one day, after shopping, she had just gotten into her car, and she noticed this older couple trying to start their car a number of times to no avail. The hood was up. Mom got out and told them how she believed in a God who answers prayer and asked them if it was okay for her to pray for their car. When they said yes, Mom laid her hands on the car and asked in Jesus' name to fix whatever the problem was. The man then got in, turned the ignition, and it started immediately. Mom never let love and faithfulness leave her, and the result was exactly what Proverbs said one would have, favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. People shared so many stories, of course, as they do at the time of a, a wake and a funeral, and any stories about my mom sure showed that she had the favor of people. Mom leaned on the Lord, and her paths were certainly straight. She was humble, never arrogant. This stance was wise, and it brought health and body and nourishment to her bones, as Proverbs says, 96 years of physical health. Mom had only one poor blood pressure reading in all her 96 years, and that was the day of her death. Even then, the reading wasn't horribly low. All her vitals were perfect right up to the end. Mom and Dad honored the Lord with their wealth, the first fruits, 10% was just the minimum of their offering with an income that was, by the way, never a large sum. Not only have they never wanted, they have been able to bless so many. Mom found wisdom and gained understanding in these gifts, as Proverbs said, quote, yielded better returns than gold. Mom's returns were rich, especially in lasting relationships with family and friends. She introduced many to the Lord and wisely encouraged so many in their faith. At the funeral, we had a, a video clip of a woman who couldn't get out to services anymore, but she had been a friend of mom. And um, she, t she talked to me. Mom had this Bible study. And, um, sh and this woman and her mom, who had come from a Greek Orthodox background, knew nothing about the Lord, knew nothing. But they had come in through their daughter, who had become a Christian. And, and she was telling me there could be 8 to 20 people there, most of them not Christians. And she said, at the time, she says, I was a real smoker. She said, I would often sit next to your mom. And she said, your mom had to go home smelling like some smokehouse. And she said, your mom never said one thing about that or some of the language that was used in that group. And she said, if she had, I wouldn't be a Christian today because I was addicted and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't give it up. But your mom just gave us John. And she says, and if you don't become a Christian, when you do, you look at John. She says, you'll never become a Christian is what this woman said. So my mom had such wisdom, even sometimes at her own probably discomfort. One of the Proverbs verses says, and when you lie down, you will not be afraid and your sleep will be sweet. My mom slept like a rock her whole life. In fact, when her dementia was there, in a childlike way, she wanted to do everything my dad did. At night when they got in bed, she would ask, Dave, what side are you laying on? He'd say, Jerry, lay on the side that feels most comfortable to you. No, Dave, she said, how are you laying? And he said, well, I guess I'll turn on my left. And she would turn over to that side. And that's how she would be till morning. The last couple of verses is about how not to withhold good from those when it is in your power to act. 
And boy, does that describe both my parents. And this scripture ends with how the Lord blesses the home of the righteous and shows favor to the humble. Solomon's words describe my mother in this passage. But mainly, what I want to share this morning are three stories. One about mom and me, and two from scripture, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. And I hope their connection will be plain at the end. The personal story I've shared mainly with my TWC church family, but the sharing has been in installments, not because of time constraints, but because of my realization of its impact and significance has been long and a deepening process. We often hear people praying for something. For example, I'm just waiting for the Lord to do, to do whatever. I started to see things differently. If any being has waited, it's our Lord. That picture in Revelations of Christ knocking at the door shows he is doing the waiting, and we on the inside are often doing the delaying. I remember how gratefully overwhelmed I was when I realized that the God of the universe, the King of kings and Lord of lords, was waiting for me to allow his grace to come in so many ways. He comes right where I am, right to the stables, even the pits of my life, and speaks in my language and helps me begin to see or repent, which brings me to a place where I can receive and experience all the good and perfect things he has for me. In the case of my stories, they have been opened through a series of doors. The initial ones, as it were, open to rather constrictive hallways, and that successful, successfully got roomier and roomier until the last door, at least the last door I'm aware of, open to a large and wonderful room called Freedom. When I was about 10 or so, Mom told me something she had done when I was first born. She told God that if I wasn't going to grow up to be a Christian and be his child and serve him, he could take me now, like then and there. Now, this was quite an amazing thing to declare, especially considering that before I was born, she had miscarried the child early on in her first pregnancy. In my mind, my mom was another Abraham. Let's be clear about this story in Genesis and what God was asking of Abraham when he told him to offer Isaac and see how it applies to my mother. God hated and continues to hate the sacrificing of children in any of its forms, which in Abraham's day was practiced by many people groups. In fact, God uses one of the strongest nouns for the practice. It was an abomination, something totally reprehensible to God. Is God going against his own character and standards in his request to Abraham? What is the difference? The practice by heathen groups was to appease their god, or gods like Moloch. The purpose for them was to, in some way, move this god to give them favor in return for this extreme act of sacrifice. It was the cruelest of bargains. It is totally different with our god. First and foremost, we have no need to appease our God because he loves us the same on our worst day as what we consider our good one. He loves me the same when I'm in a state of confusion, even doubt and struggle, as he does when I feel strong in my faith. Appeasing our God is an absolute impossibility. For by grace are we saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I think God put this story there for us to see that, like Abraham, we can first learn to know that it is God speaking to us. We, like Abraham, can have the eyes and ears of our hearts become fine-tuned to God's voice, to his promptings. Second, when we are obedient to those promptings, like Abraham was over and over again, we know God's got good things and provision in store, even when what he says seems out of the box or out of our comfort zone. Abraham's life is a testament to that verse in Hebrews. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And faith, this verse conveys two thoughts. 
It is first believing that he exists, the first level. But then much more than that, believing that he is a rewarder, a rewarder, a blesser of them that seek him. Abraham was firmly entrenched in his view of God being a rewarder, a Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Isaac was a miracle child whose birth was the start of the fulfillment of God's given promise. Not a bargaining on Abraham's part. It was a promise that the blessing Abraham's faith had released would now, through Isaac's seed, bless the whole earth. To Abraham, Isaac and the promise were God's doing. And maybe that's exactly where my mom was. He knit me in her womb, and I was his, and that was all there was to it. When mom and I talked about her prayer when I was 10, I remember saying, Yeah, mom, you put me on a tightrope. A wrong move and zap, it's over. And we laughed together. But another part of me, a deep unconscious part, didn't laugh because my little spirit put me on that tightrope and there were ramifications. I grew up a people pleaser and things were very black and white. After all, there's not much room on a tightrope, my poor daughters and husband. <laughs> I had strong opinions about things, but often didn't share them because I didn't want to push people away from me. But I sure shared, ranted, and judged in my mind. As I have come to see, both these things are rooted in fear. The fear of people and what they thought about me, and the fear of rejection and the need to be right, especially getting it just right in line with how I perceive things about God. So on one hand, I knew God loved me, and I loved him. All my life, as, even as a child, I had warm experiences with the Lord as I talked and prayed to him and read his word. So both these opposite sides existed within me and grew. This fear rose up when I wanted to share my Christian faith. But often I couldn't because maybe it wouldn't work for that person because they didn't know how to walk that Christian line, so it wouldn't work for them. Of course, this left me with guilt, like I was denying him, who I knew loved me. And there was one time when this fear raised its ugly head and sent me reeling emotionally. It was within the first couple of days after bringing Allison, our first daughter, home from the hospital. I stood over her little crib and wanted to say over her, what my mom had said over me. I so wanted to, but I couldn't. I was too afraid that God would take me up on it. I had heard, but do not believe this now. People say, be careful with what you pray as if on a whim God is going to do something that would harm or be bad for us just because we say something in a moment of weakness or even intense desire. I wept because I was just too afraid to say this. At the time, I hoped that it was a case of hormones and not a lack of faith. But you know, we cannot take someone else's experience and foist it on ourselves. Abraham heard God. As Hebrew says about him in this experience with Isaac, Abraham absolutely believed if he sacrificed Isaac, God would raise him from the dead. Abraham was all ready, not for a funeral, but for a resurrection miracle is what Hebrews tells us. And I see my mother wanting the absolute best for me and loving and thinking of me far more than herself. To her, the best possible thing for her and me was for me to love and be in close relationship with God. But I didn't have my mom's history and I didn't hear God's voice. I imposed on myself a tightrope act, and I just couldn't take this step on the rope. Fearing God in that way is not the reverential fear that is the beginning of wisdom, as Proverbs says. It was a fear of appeasement, thinking pleasing God required wrenching acts. That kind of fear is such a liar about who he is. But again, this left me with nagging guilt about my lack of faith. 
But in spite of my often feeling like I failed, I continued to have these wonderful, warm times with God. And he often surprised me. I remember once I was in a low period, taking little or no time for devotions and prayer, feeling like I had put God on a shelf. I decided to go to a meeting where a speaker who had a prophetic and discerning ministry was sharing. I said to myself, okay, I'll go get prayer and my correction and discipline, my deserved spanking, as it were, for my present state. And the totally opposite happened. God used someone who knew me well, the person who started this church, Harold. And he came to me. I was on the floor, kind of in prayer, and he spoke beautiful, encouraging things to me about my life. This affirmation from God was certainly not the first nor the last, because there were many. About 16 years ago, this turmoil all came to a head. I saw that this fear I had that God might take things away was simply not how he had shown himself to be in my life. He had given to me over and over in abundant ways. Even when there was the need to repent, the experiences were always just how 2 Corinthians describes them, the godly sorrow which leads to wonderful joy. I saw that the fruit of the Spirit not only described God, but they were the basis for how he had been to me all my life. He had loved me. He had given me joy, had been so steadfast, faithful, and patient, 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 and gentle. Oh, so gentle. And these two opposing things, the fear and the actual experience with him, were pulling me apart. I remember going to the altar one Sunday night and crying my heart out with the words, I don't know where or how this fear of you started, but you don't deserve it. You have never, ever treated me in a way to justify this fear, but I don't know how to get rid of it. You're just going to have to show me and help me. You're going to have to put this divided me back together and make me whole and give me a pure and undivided heart. And I kept praying this prayer. One evening, feeling emotionally drained, I went to a friend's house, actually Gloria Clark. Many of you knew her. She and I had shared some powerful times of prayer together. I began telling her about a number of the incidents when this fear had overtaken me. And when I got to the one about Allison being born, she said, Whoa, Jan, God doesn't give things just to take them away. And she prayed a heavy-duty prayer for me. I remember experiencing a tangible feeling that I could only describe as a square piece pushing itself out of a round hole in my body. After this, things began to change. I felt and saw the fear losing its grip. My moving to the large place, this large room was coming. And here's how it happened. I was looking at the story in Matthew 15 about the Canaanite woman who came to Jesus asking him for her daughter's healing. Now, in the past, I'd been kind of uncomfortable with this story. The way he treats the woman is so opposite of how he treated all the other women in Scripture. First, he ignores her. She cries out for him to have mercy on her, and Scripture says he did not answer her a word. Then he excludes her. He said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And finally, he actually calls her a name, a dog. I couldn't reconcile this account, especially while on the tightrope. But I started looking at scripture in a new way. God certainly didn't need to record things in order for him to remember them like King Azarus did in Esther. Biblical accounts weren't journal entries for Job, Abraham, Noah, and others to go back and look over. Rather, I realized that everything in Scripture is there for me to see something about life and our Heavenly Father, to see people's good choices or bad ones and the resulting consequences. As our pastor once said, we are all free to make whatever choices we want to make. What we can't choose are the consequences. So I began to see this story in a new way. 
this woman at three points in the natural could have taken offense. Even if she didn't say anything aloud in her mind, she could have been thinking, well, what kind of man is this? He certainly isn't fair. He certainly isn't what people have said, him, he, uh, have said about him. I'm not going to stay around here and take this. But how does this woman act? How does she respond? It says that even after he came only for Israel, she still came kneeling, worshipped him, and kept praying, Lord, help me. And after Jesus said, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, in one of the purest examples of humility, she says, yes, Lord. Yet even the little pups eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Now, I believe Jesus knew by the spirit, the inner metal and fortitude and what was really at the heart of this woman. To be honest, I don't think he could have used me in this way as an example. I would have been too insecure and would have caved into anger and left either in a huff or a wilted being. But this woman wouldn't let anything deter her from her desire for her daughter and her faith in Jesus. Who does offense hurt? If I get offended, I am the one who loses. This woman not only receives her desire, but can't you see the smile on Jesus' face when he compliments her and reveals to everyone else present what kind of person that he already knew she really was? Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done as you wish. And her daughter was cured from that moment. Who would have lost out as she had taken offense? Of course, she and her daughter would have. And I think through this story, Christ is trying to get across to us that it is the same with us. Taking offense robs us of good things in life, especially in our relationships. Around the same time I started seeing this story, I was coming to an end of having some sessions with a professional counselor. I had reached a point in my life where I had seen many things changing in my life, and I didn't want to leave any stones unturned. In the second to the last session with the counselor, I told her what my mother had said over me as a baby. Her eyes widened like saucers, and she was speechless. As soon as I got into my car, the Lord spoke right into my mind and heart saying, I suppose your mother shouldn't have told you what she spoke to me over you. And by him saying suppose, I sensed he was telling me he knew my struggle, but still it was important for me to know what mom had said. He continued, but no, Jan, what that really affected was your view of me and your wrong view of who I am and was, was to me like water running off a duck's back. He said, I knew why you had that wrong view. But no, that the faith of your mother had a far greater impact on your life than your wrong fear view of me ever did. I wept. You know, 20 or 30 seconds here happened a long time ago, and it's as real as it happened yesterday. You know, 20 or 30 seconds of hearing truth from the Lord takes care of things, lies really, that we have been butting up against our whole lives. As scripture says, the truth will set you free. Power in his words. And that last door, at last I think it's the last one in this area of my life, open to a large sunny place of thankfulness for my mother and a new insight of God. And a new insight always accompanies such changes, I'll tell you. Of all beings, he who knows everything about me has the right to be offended by what I do and choices I make. But what he chooses to see is the whys, why we are doing, not the whats. And not only that, he has provision already in place for my healing and restoration. And how can he provide so perfectly? I see it this way. 
A scientist makes a maze to watch how his experimental animals choose path. He watches. He doesn't plan the choices. Our God has created our environment. Eden was the perfect environment he prepared for us. Our God is outside of time. He sees and knows everything from the beginning to the end. He doesn't choose for us, but he sees, and that's why he can provide so perfectly anyone whose heart is there. Even if we don't know we have a heart for him, he sees it. He is the lamb who, scripture says, was slain before the foundation of the world. Just think about that. His death was not an afterthought, a knee-jerk reaction plan of God. The provision for our redemption was already in place before sin was ever even committed. And when I think of my mother, what I saw as a prayer about my not growing up and being in relation with God, I now see so differently. What if God saw that I would break her heart? Even more, come to the end and not be a child of God because of arrogance and rebellion, a fool as Psalms and Proverbs declare such a person to be. God knew what was the most important thing for me and my mom, who was standing in the gap for me. Who would have suffered if God in his mercy saw me at the end separated because I followed Satan's agenda? Certainly not me, because mom and dad had put me in Jesus' arms from moment one. Mom and dad would have been the ones to suffer the lost child. But what was most important to mom was not her comfort, but my well-being for now and eternity. And as an aside, if God saw that I was headed for a lost eternity and took me as a baby, would that have been unjust or a beautiful act of mercy to assure that I was in his presence forever? Just think how some people might have judged this. How could God do such a thing? Where was God in this? How and what and why God does and what he does do is so opposite of how we, with very limited view, judge things to be and certainly judge our amazing God. So let us know that without God's extreme plan born out of his love for us, death, separation, isolation, and misery would have been the end of all our stories. Let us do as Colossians 1 says, give thanks to the Father who has qualified and made us fit to share the inheritance of the saints in light. The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. And as we sing in that song, our sin, not in part but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Thank you, God, for all you've done, for not taking offense for all we do or don't do, for not taking offense at how long it takes us to grasp the reality, the glory of who you are, your goodness, mercy, and loving kindness. Thank you for all your provision, and especially on that morning I said the legacy of my mom and her influence. As the Lord said to Abraham, if you obey my commandments, I will bless you and the nations around you. Obedience is nothing more than living a life in such a way that our choices allow us to enter into all that God has for us, to enable us to receive his blessings and be positioned to bless others and be involved in his kingdom work. I thank my God for parents who had obedient servant hearts, and they had allowed the Lord to touch and bless me and many others. I celebrated my mom that morning. I said, thanks, mom, for your rice pudding. <laughs> Some of you have experienced that rice pudding. And more importantly, her joyous and ever-present smile. I, don't, I guess we couldn't get that picture up. It's a, it's a beautiful, it was a beautiful smile. I celebrate my mom. Pardon? Was it up? Did it get there? Oh, there it is. Isn't that a wonderful smile? Can't you see? She was really known for a rice pudding and that smile. <laughs> um, and I celebrated my mom and that morning offered heartfelt gratitude for the life she lived and left legacy. You may not have had a nurturing upbringing. There may have been trauma in your life, part of your life. But no, there is such power in his words. I mean, he put creation in place um, with his words. 
And I love that verse in, um, in uh, Ephesians that I often go to and pray over myself and others. And, um, and one thing it, it, it says that, um, and so you can know the immeasurable, unlimited, surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now, just think of that. That same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead can go to all those dark, all those places we don't even know about, where he's standing at the door and knocking, and when we're ready, as I read in a devotional, our coordinates are the here and now. That's where God meets us, right there in the present. Now, he meets us in the present. He can bring his words to impact that past and even the future, but it is in the here and now. So I just want to say that um, I am so grateful for his working. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider, and he is Jehovah Nissi. His banner over us is love, 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 and that's what I've experienced in my life, and I'm just so grateful for everything that he, he has done. And there's an expectancy that there's still so much more to come. Thank you for allowing me to share this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jan. I never tried your mother's rice pudding, but uh, we've certainly um, tried lots of the dishes that you're be best known for, uh, and there's a lot of them. Gumbo, I think, is one. Oh, that's Allison's. There's a brie, I think. That's a. What else, Lori? What's what's another one? Bacon dip, that's another one, yes. Strawberry butter. Strawberry butter. Testify. <laughs> it's the most engaged everybody's been all morning. <laughs> well, uh, for those who are joining us by stream, this is the end of our time together. Uh, thanks so much for joining. And for all the mothers and the daughters on the stream, be blessed this week. Uh, you guys are an amazing expression of God and his creation. So um, go this week and look for everything that he's got in store for you. Amen? And we'll see you. Thank you. Thanks for that amen, Cohen. And we will see you next week. goodness of God.